Hi and welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. So you went to pine64.org. You found the Pinebook Pro. You clicked the buttons, you hummed and hawed for all of about a microsecond, and you pressed add to cart. You ordered it, and you waited for it to ship. Finally, you got that shipping notification. So you waited some more. You waited and waited and waited. Some would say patiently. You and I both know that's not the case. But finally, the knock came on the door. Your Pinebook Pro has arrived. You ripped into the packaging. You didn't even stop to think, hey, maybe I should do an unboxing video. No, there's no time for that. You need to get into this device. Your Pinebook Pro is beautiful. How did they do this for 200 bucks? You power it on for the first time and it doesn't work. That is the scenario for too many people right now, as there have been some problems with the latest run of Pinebook Pros. I've got some good news for you though. They're easy problems for you to resolve. I'm gonna show you how, I'm gonna tell you kind of what happened. I'm gonna tell you two of the most common issues with this run of Pinebook Pros, and I'm gonna show you how to fix it. Stick around. Live recordings are trusted only to solid state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit category5.tv. It's so great to have you here. My name is Robbie, and uh, I am your host once again this week. Uh, because nobody else is allowed in our studio space due to the current situation. But hey, I'm here and uh, it is so great to have you joining me as well, whether you're here live or if you're watching after the fact on demand, it's great to see you. Uh, this show would not be possible if it wasn't for the support of its community. And in particular, I want to say a big thanks to BP9 today, Scott Barkley, Ron Morissette, Jerry Kowalski, Jonathan Garby, Jens Nissen, Bo Leknowski, and Bill Marshall, plus everyone else who has supported us through Patreon, uh, through our Kickstarter campaign to get us moved into this space. I appreciate your support so very much, and you know that we wouldn't be able to do this show, especially mid-pandemic and, and with the whole uh, having to move uh, into our new studio space, but we're here we're safe and the show goes on uh, week to week. Things start to feel a little more um, structured and a little more um, technically sound. Um, each week, there's there are new challenges. This week, it's been pre-processing things and getting everything up and going and getting things working. Um, previous weeks, I haven't had enough HDMI ports that have been run, you know, through the walls into the uh, the main studio space, and and so we're working things, working uh, on things and getting everything set up. And week to week, we get stronger, we get better, and it does get better and better every single week, doesn't it? So thank you for being here. Thank you all for your support. If you'd like to support us and you haven't done so yet, or maybe you've done so in the past and you'd like to do it on an ongoing basis, um, probably the easiest way and kind of a cool way to get involved in the show is to go to patreon.com slash category five. And the reason I mentioned Patreon is because it has some perks and it makes it really, really cool because when you subscribe, you choose what perks you would like. 
and then uh, we honor those um, and you get things like behind the scenes access or uh, perhaps you want to be able to watch the live show but on demand maybe you can't make it during the live broadcast but you like that behind the scenes look uh, and you like to be able to see the bloopers and those kinds of things that get edited out um, for the the on-demand version of the show so those are some of the perks and and uh, you can go to patreon.com slash category five to learn more um, and of course there are other ways to support us through our website uh, as well I don't need to get into all the details but you'll find the support us link uh, on the menu system at category five TV before we jump into the show this week I want to remind you please subscribe to us on YouTube and uh, click that bell and that's going to ensure that you get the notifications every time we post a new video like this one and all of the videos that we post over on Linux Tech Show as well so make sure you subscribe that would be fantastic we're trying to achieve uh, 25,000 subscribers uh, within the next let's say the, the let's try to do this in June I joked last week that I'm only gonna give you until the end of May but realistically hey we're just trying to hit that 25,000 land kind of milestone uh, and I think we can do it we're very very close I think we're within about 400 subscribers so if you haven't subscribed on YouTube yet head over to linuxtechshow.com and that's a really great way to be able to receive notifications when there are new episodes and also a great way to interact with us because you can like those videos you can comment on them and uh, and they're edited down as well so you don't have to sit through the full hour you can just watch a little two or five minute video um, sometimes a little more than that but you don't have to watch the full hour and you know all this rambling that I that I do <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. So our show this week, I've decided to transition. As you saw there in the intro, um, I've transitioned the show this week because of the latest shipment of the Pinebook Pro. So in a little bit, uh, a little later in the show, I'm going to be going through those uh, those issues that I mentioned at the top of the show um, to be able to help you if you have experienced those problems with your Pinebook Pro. I want to be able to help you to be able to correct them. So, and that is in particular the Wi-Fi or the inability to boot. So, you want to stick around for that. Um, but we are moving back our MicroTik series uh, by one week in in lieu of that. Um, but I still want to um, show some love to the MicroTik community as well. Um, so let's jump over. Let's jump over to um, comments, questions, concerns regarding our MicroTik series. You can find out more about this MicroTik series at cat5.tv slash MicroTik. A real quick rundown for you. This series is designed to help you get from never using a MicroTik device to being able to do some really cool advanced stuff with your MicroTik router. MicroTik routers, the reason that we are featuring them is because they are affordable consumer priced routers but the feature set that they include is more like that of an enterprise router so you're getting way more than you pay for and we're able to do basically anything with a microtech router that you can with those enterprise you know devices that are 10 times the price and you can have one at home they are perfect for small medium sized businesses uh, because they are so affordable and yet so secure and so capable so looking at the MicroTik devices um, through the course of the series at cat5.tv slash MicroTik, you're going to be able to learn um, from the get-go how to use them, how to program them, how to set up your networking. And that series is available for you. How much money, Robbie? Absolutely free. Zero dollars. So cat5.tv slash MicroTik is where you can enjoy that series, which is ongoing. And uh, so it's a great opportunity for you to be able to learn more about these devices. So jumping over to our YouTube channel at linuxtechshow.com. First of all, Dr. Reality One wants to say, this is a great tutorial, many thanks. And Dr. Reality One, 
um, in reference to one of those micro tick uh, tutorials. I appreciate that very, very much. Uh, as you can imagine, a lot of work goes into the show, a lot of work goes into the series, and I am passionate about these devices and the technology that we demonstrate here. And I'm so glad that you're, that you're enjoying that. TCC says, I'm glad to see someone giving Microtech some love. Yes. Um, how can you not? I think the only people, TCC, who would not give love to Microtech, as you say, are those who have never used Microtech or maybe never even heard of Microtech. I mean, you, you go to a, a super center back in the days when we had those and could walk into a retail store and just buy things off the shelf. Those were interesting times. But back then, I mean, what did, what did you see? Netgear? Linksys? Right? Microtech? No, I don't know that I've ever seen it in a super center. So I think that may be it. Maybe it's that it's not that people wouldn't love it if they knew about it. So maybe that's why I'm showing some love to Microtech because I want our viewers to know that, hey, there's something that's better, there's something that is affordable, and something that is fantastic and secure. Rockaway CCW says, my Microtech came in the mail yesterday. Yes. I tried to name my Wi-Fi. This is not the Wi-Fi you're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> but it wouldn't let me. Oh, see, I said Microtech can do anything, but you have to have a valid SSID. Um, that, I guess, is, I just assumed that you knew that. Um, maybe there's a character limit, or maybe it, I'm reading again, uh, or maybe it doesn't like spaces or punctuation, not sure. So instead, I named the 5 gigahertz, not yours, and the 2 gigahertz, DEA, surveillance van. All right, so you got two networks, the five gigahertz for your own usage and this DEA surveillance van. Can I suggest, uh, if you want to play this fun game, that uh, you look at um, on at cat5.tv slash microtech rockaway CCW. Um, I did a tutorial on how to set up a true guest Wi-Fi and you could use that virtual WLAN and then that way you're not using your, your, you know, your two gigahertz because you might want to use that for something for real, right? But you could set up a virtual wireless LAN and it could be named with a silly SSID like that if you like. So Rockaway CCW goes on. This is a long comment, folks. In fact, it was sent in two parts. It says, I'd like to have the two gigahertz Wi-Fi DEA surveillance van activate and deactivate at random times <laughs> to mimic a van cruising around the area to freak out my crackhead neighbors. <laughs> oh boy. Is there a way to do that? Rockaway CCW asks. You never know the motivation of these questions, but hey, okay, so I said you can do anything with Microtech and truly Truly, you can. So I'll just jump over to my Pinebook Pro here, which has WebFig up and running and Rockaway CCW. Yes, there, it would be possible to do that. Okay, so first of all, I want to remind you that DEA underscore surveillance van, that is your SSID. That's not your, your interface name. Um, so what we want to obtain is your interface name. So over here, um, you may remember if you've been following the series, uh, go up to wireless and click wireless and you see, okay, so find your 2.4 gigahertz. Two, so there it is, 2 gigahertz. It's the one in the middle. It is WLAN1 on my Microtech. It may be different on yours, but find out which one it is. You need to know the name of that. So in my case, it's all lowercase WLAN1. Now, what I want to do is go into system and scheduler. 
And in the course of this series, I have mentioned that the microtick is programmable. So that's essentially what we're going to do. We're going to program it uh, using the scheduler because you mentioned that you want this to happen. You said at random times it's not actually going to be random. In our case, we'll do it on a schedule and it will recur. So it will turn on and then off and on and off. Um, so add new. And we're going to call this one, name it um, turn off 2.4 gigahertz. And my start date, it's setting it automatically to tomorrow's date. I want to set it to today just so that you see it happening right away. And I'm going to set it to uh, 12 o'clock on the button with an interval. Now, you would probably, if you want it to be every minute, right? You could do something like that if you want it to be every 10 minutes, something like that. For the case of the, uh, for the sake of the demonstration, I'm going to do every 10 seconds, keeping in mind we're going to be turning it on and off, on and off. So it's actually going to be every five seconds. I'm going to set the interval as such. So, uh, but that will just make it so that we can see it right away. So the on event is where we're actually going to program it. So we're going to say interface wireless disable. What was the name of it? WLAN 1. Okay. As soon as I hit OK, I'm going to lose my WLAN 1. So if I head over to, because see, it's, it's already scheduled it, and it's going to say run count, and that's going to start increasing. See that? 1. So now my wireless is off. So if I go to wireless now, you can see WLAN 1 has been disabled. So go back to your scheduler, because we need to, now the van has driven away, presumably. Right? So we want to make it so that the van has returned. Let's put this into a scenario that maybe makes a little more sense because I, I understand Rockaway CCW is being a little bit silly here, but uh, I'm still happy to oblige. Let's think about a parent who wants to be able to turn, uh, so set your guest Wi-Fi, uh, use that tutorial to create a Wi-Fi for your kids to use. Then have it turn it off automatically at curfew. Okay, so let's use that as the, there's a really good scenario. I like that. So there you go. Um, okay, so here we're now creating, remember where I am here, I'm under system scheduler and I'm creating a new one. So add new. I don't have anything to turn it back on. So re-enable um, 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi. And this could be any interface, right? Um, it doesn't have to be Wi-Fi. Um, in our case, that's the demonstration. But So interface, wireless, enable, WLAN 1 is what that one is called. So now it's to look at the schedule. So remember, I set the other one to 12 o'clock right on the button. So I'm setting this the same just to make it easy for you to see um, on the third, which is when I'm filming this uh, live, and we're setting this to 10 seconds. So right now it's, it's set to happen at exactly the same time as our other schedule, which turns it off. So basically these are going to cancel each other out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to offset this one by five seconds. So every five seconds we're going to have the Wi-Fi turn off, and then five seconds later it's going to turn back on, even though each task is happening every 10 seconds. So if all goes well, I'm going to hit OK, and we should see that that one is going to run. And see the schedule there? They're off by five seconds. Re-enable has run. OK, let's jump back over to wireless and watch my WLAN. Just watch it. I'm not going to touch a thing here. My hands are off. It's on. Watch WLAN 1, and it's off. That is going to continue happening indefinitely. It's going to keep going on and off and on and off. Now, use the scenario that I gave you uh, for those of you who are not trying to simulate a van. Um, and maybe use this to schedule that the internet turns off for the particular Wi-Fi that your kids are using at 9 o'clock p.m. And it turns back on at 7 o'clock in the morning. Or maybe you, you're having a homeschool right now, right? The scheduler can be set to only Saturdays, and it can turn on at 7. But maybe because you're homeschooling now, you want it to start at 10 a.m. because you want the kids to get their schoolwork done first or something like that. That is a cool idea. Um, one final note for you, Rockaway um, CCW. You could actually use TX-Power 
as part of your command. So just to put this out there, I'm not going to show you how to do this because this is getting into a little bit more sophistication. You'll probably need to create a script and then initiate that script with your scheduler. But you could have it start at like full power and turn down the power every second so that it seems as though the van is actually getting closer and then getting further away because the signal strength keeps going up gets really strong, sits there at full strength for about 10 minutes, and then tapers off and goes down. You could actually do that using TX-Power when you're programming that. Oh man, putting ideas in your head. All right, so the question that I want to pose this week is through the course of this MicroTick series at cat5.tv slash MicroTick, would you like me to be continuing to use my web browser? webfig, or would you prefer that I use Winbox, which is the installable client from Microtik? The advantage to, um, like just really, really quick advantage to Winbox is that it has multitasking built in and it is a tabbed layout instead of scrolling down. The advantage to using the uh, web browser is of course, it's not at all reliant on um, what program I'm using. I can just be using Firefox, Chrome, I'm using Brave. Um, some folks argue that um, perhaps the client is more secure. Others argue that the browser is more secure. Um, and sometimes it's a moot point because um, the browser access I have not opened up to the world. It is only accessible within my LAN, so it's not a security risk whatsoever as far as that goes. So needless to say, tell me which one do you want? Webfig, the browser interface, or Winbox, the application that allows you to connect to your Microtik and manage it that way. And you have to tell me in your comment below, why? Don't just say Winbox. I want to know why. Why are you suggesting I use Winbox? What makes you prefer it? Why are you suggesting I use Webfig? And why? Do you prefer it? That's my question that I'm posing to you this week, and I'll be back again with more at cat5.tv slash microtech. I gotta take a quick break, folks. I'll be right back. We're all struggling during these trying times and Pine64 presses on and has been working hard to fulfill orders in spite of the state of our world right now. With the latest run of Pinebook Pros going out amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, things haven't gone as smoothly as we'd all hope. And a couple of problems have cropped up so far with the latest shipment. I'm gonna cover two such issues with the May-June 2020 run of Pinebook Pros, Wi-Fi not working and an inability to boot. Stick around, I'll show you how to fix both of these problems. The issue? Pine64 can't provide their own quality assurance or quality control during the pandemic. They don't have access to the factory and they may not even be able to enter the factories until September. It's not ideal, and no doubt the team at Pine64 are feeling frustrated or even potentially upset that some of these issues have cropped up. But like everyone else, they're doing the absolute best they possibly can during these difficult times. So what's the best that we can do as their community? I think it's to support one another and spread information to help each other to be able to get up and running quickly should we encounter these problems. Hopefully this information reaches you ahead of your Pinebook Pro shipment and that way you're going to know what to do. So let's get our maker on. First problem, a beautiful yet sadly unbootable Pinebook Pro. If your newly arrived Pinebook Pro simply won't boot, first thing you want to do is try to boot from an SD card. And if it boots from the SD, it's possible the eMMC storage is disabled with a hardware switch. And you may need to flip the eMMC disable switch. Unfortunately, it seems that 
while some of the current run of Pinebook Pros had that switch enabled out of the factory, which means their eMMC storage is physically disabled. And when I say eMMC, think of that in terms of hard drive, the storage medium within the, the Pinebook Pro. So let's open up our Pinebook Pro to correct this. First off, I've already removed the 10 screws just to expedite this procedure for the air. Uh, this is the hinge at the back and I'm just going to carefully pry upward, but not all the way because the speakers are affixed with a double-sided adhesive. So I want to just kind of carefully reach in here and peel those off. So one over here and one here. And the reason I've done that is because I don't want to pull on these very, very fine wires that are connecting those. There we are. Okay, so now I'm going to, oh, and I should mention, I have cut myself on these edges before. This is a very, very thin metal and it is very sharp. So as you're doing this, be very mindful of that. Be careful. As I say, I have cut myself even live on the air on this. So I want to warn you about that. Okay, I'm going to turn this around so you've got a little bit of a better view. And I want to show you, this is the eMMC chip right here. You can see I've got a 64 gig storage uh, medium here, eMMC. And that's just a chip that uh, you, can, you can remove and replace if you want, uh, but that's included with your Pinebook Pro. However, as we can see here, the switch is set toward the front. This is the switch that enables and disables the uh, eMMC. So what I need to do is take that switch and very carefully flip it toward the hinge mechanism. All right, so I've just flipped that over and now it's as simple as that. Let's put this case back on, being mindful of the sharp edges. Always put the case back on before you flip it over, otherwise you may lose some of the internal plastic components that kind of elevate things. Flip that over and let's give it a test. So I'm going to carefully open up my Pinebook Pro and let's see if she boots. I've got a power light now, which is promising. It's turned green. And we've got the Manjaro logo and we're booting up. Fantastic. And there you go. We're greeted with the KDE Plasma login screen on Manjaro Linux. So I'm just going to quickly log in here. And we should be good to go, right? No, hold up. Remember, I said there were two problems. We're in, but Wi-Fi isn't working. It's, in fact, not working at all. The way I can determine that, and you may go through this, is if you jump down to the wireless configuration, wireless network down near the clock, click that, and it's as if there is no wireless. Well, see, the reason why your Pinebook Pro Wi-Fi isn't working is because <sighs> the factory left the privacy switches on during testing. See, there's a Wi-Fi privacy switch on your Pinebook Pro. That's great, right? Well, you press the Pine64 logo while at the same time pressing F11, and then your Wi-Fi chip will be enabled or disabled. Now, the Catch-22, though, is that the Wi-Fi chip is not hot swappable. However, the privacy switch, being that it's an actual physical hardware switch, is cutting power to the chip. So upon turning it back on, it's not going to work. So even if you turn it off and on again, unfortunately that fix is not going to work in this case. When you press and hold the Pine logo, and press F11, you're going to see a series of flashes on your numlock. Three flashes means that it's disabled. Pine button and F11. Two flashes means it's enabled. Remember, three flashes. One, two, three. My Wi-Fi chip is now powered off. Press it again. One, two. The Wi-Fi chip is now powered on. However, I still don't have wireless. So what I need to do now is I do, in fact, need to reboot my Manjaro Linux. Let's do it. Back at the login. And if all went well, 
We've solved both of those issues today. Let's find out. And almost to my desktop. Oh, I saw a Wi-Fi connection there. Click and there we go. Wireless is now enabled. One last tip, when you're connecting to your wireless, if you have access to five gigahertz Wi-Fi, please connect to that. You're gonna get a better signal and uh, because we have shared frequencies between Bluetooth and the wireless adapter, if you go on a 2.4 gigahertz, you're going to uh, possibly, potentially, encounter other issues with your Bluetooth devices. So use five gigahertz if you can for your Wi-Fi connectivity. Now, no doubt this whole procedure is going to be improved in time, and it really only came to light because of the fact that the wireless privacy switch was enabled out of the factory. Uh, I believe that they're going to fix this with software in the future, so please watch for some updates. And for more help with your Pinebook Pro, check out their comprehensive wiki page on pine64.org. And if you can't find what you're looking for, they also provide a community forum and they are active on Twitter, Reddit, IRC, Telegram, Discord, among others. And you'll find each at pine64.org. We have to take a quick break. Stick around. This is Category 5 Technology TV. So great to have you here. Hey, have you checked out our website lately? Category5.tv. When you're there, you'll notice that we've got a, a lot of great features right there on our homepage. Not only do we have the community coffee break, which happens every single week. Incidentally, there's one uh, coming up this Sunday. So make sure you're there. I believe that's June 7th. And uh, you'll find out more details on our website, category5.tv. Scrolling up a ways from that, there is the Crypto Corner with Robert Koenig. We're going to be hearing from him today as well. And uh, that's right there on our website if you want to learn about cryptocurrency, where things are at with the market. And Robert, incidentally, is going to be doing some uh, teaching um, series with us as well um, to share a little bit more of the intricate de details of how cryptocurrency as well as the blockchain technology itself works, which I'm really looking forward to learning myself. Um, and beyond that, our website brings together all the features that we do here on the show. So when you hear me talking about various technologies, we have it laid out so that you can find information about those things. So what I mean by that is when I talk about the Pinebook Pro, you can go to our website, category5.tv, click on Pinebook Pro, and you'll get a list of all the videos and all the times that I talked about that. So there may be more videos that are of interest to you that have to do with that particular topic. So I'd encourage you to check it out. It's category5.tv. At this point, we need to head over to the newsroom. Here's Becca. Here's what's coming up in the category5.tv newsroom. Walmart employees are speaking up about the inaccuracy of their anti-theft AI. Sony has delayed hosting a showcase event for its next games console. A brand new release from Raspberry Pi now has 8 gigabytes of RAM on a Pi 4. Microsoft themselves are warning users to think twice before installing the Windows 10 2004 update. And researchers in Australia claim they have recorded the fastest ever internet data speed. Stick around, the full details in this week's Crypto Corner are coming up. This is the Category5.tv Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. From the newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Walmart users uses AI technology to detect shoplifters at self-checkout, and a group of store associates are concerned that it's putting their health at risk. A group of Walmart employees say they were past their breaking point with Everseen, a small artificial intelligence firm based in Ireland whose technology Walmart began using in 2017. Walmart uses Everseen in thousands of stores to prevent shoplifting at registers and self-checkout kiosks. But the workers claimed it misidentified innocuous behavior as theft and often failed to stop actual instances of stealing.
The group of employees has chosen to stay anonymous since they are not authorized to speak to the press. They told the press that they are dismayed that their employer, one of the largest retailers in the world, is relying on AI they believe to be flawed. One worker said that the technology was sometimes even referred to internally as never seen because of its frequent mistakes. The worker said they had been upset about Walmart's use of ever seen for years and claimed colleagues had raised concerns about the technology to managers but were rebuked. They decided to speak to the press, they said, after a June 2019 Business Insider article reported Walmart's partnership with Everseen publicly for the first time. The story described how Everseen uses AI to analyze footage from surveillance cameras installed in the ceiling and can detect issues in real time, such as when a customer places an item in their bag without scanning it. When the system spots something, it automatically alerts store associates. The concerned associates produced a video to prove their concerns were valid. It begins with a person using self-checkout to buy two jumbo packages, uh, packages of Reese's White Peanut Butter Cups. Because the packages are stacked on top of each other, only one is scanned, but both are successfully placed in the bagging area without issue. The same person then grabs two gallons of milk by their handles and moves them across the scanner with one hand. Only one is rung up, but both are put in the bagging area. They then put their own cell phone on top of the machine and an alert pops up saying they need to wait for assistance, a false positive. The filmmaker repeats the same process at two more stores where they fail to scan a heart-shaped Valentine's Day chocolate box with a puppy on the front and a Philips Sony Care electric toothbrush. The video concludes that Everseen failed to stop more than $100 of would-be theft. The employees believe that the tech frequently misinterprets innocent behavior as potential shoplifting, which frustrates customers and store associates and leads to longer lines. One worker described it as a noisy tech, a fake AI that just pretends to safeguard. The coronavirus pandemic has given their concerns more urgency. One associate said they worry false positives could be causing Walmart workers to break social distancing guidelines unnecessarily. Whenever seen uh, flags an issue, a store associate see, uh, needs to intervene and determine whether shoplifting or another problem is taking place. A corporate Walmart manager even expressed strong concern that workers were being put at risk by additional contact necessitated by false positives and asked whether the Everseen system should be turned off to protect customers and workers. This, of course, comes at a time when self-checkout may become even more important for stores as customers look for low-risk ways to shop. Sony has delayed hosting a showcase event for its next games console. Sony did not directly mention the civil unrest in the U.S., but alluded to it, saying we do not feel that right now is a time for celebration, adding it wanted more important voices to be heard. The firm had been set to unveil some of the games in development for its forthcoming PlayStation 5 on Thursday. Hours later, Activision delayed the release of new Call of Duty content. The firm said now is not the time to launch new seasons for Modern Warfare, Warzone, or Call of Duty Mobile. It had been expected that both free-to-play products would launch this week, presenting the firm a fresh opportunity to sell character outfits and other in-game items. Other technology firms have also cancelled planned launch events. Games publisher Electronic Arts postponed its reveal event for its latest sports title, Madden NFL 21. And Google had earlier delayed an online event for the next version of Android. Sony's move avoids the risks inherent in trying to promote games likely to involve violent combat at a time when standoffs and clashes are occurring across the U.S. Other game companies that are planning launches over the coming days may now come under pressure to reconsider their plans as well. Single board computer fans, especially those who love the Raspberry Pi, are ecstatic at the surprise release of the new Raspberry Pi 4 with a whopping 8GB RAM. Yes, 8GB. That's double the max memory they had until now been available. The Raspberry Pi 4 launched just under a year ago and is a very powerful little SPC, but two things about it were really lacking. No eMMC uh, storage capabilities and a maximum of 4 gigabytes RAM, though 4 gigabytes is still quite impressive for a little SPC. While eMMC is still not available on the Raspberry Pi, it boasts double the previous maximum amount of memory. 
That said, gone are the days of the Raspberry Pi being the $25 SBC. The price is now $75 US and up here in Canada it cost us $110 to order one plus shipping. This makes it the most expensive Raspberry Pi ever released. So why the surprise? When the Raspberry Pi 4 was released, an 8GB DDR4 package wasn't available, but Micron stepped things up earlier this year providing the necessary component for the upgrade. Unlike its predecessors, whose SoC can support no more than 4GB RAM, the processor used in the Raspberry Pi 4 can technically support up to 16GB of memory in total, so while 8GB is incredible in this space, it's not the absolute max. We've got to take a quick break. The Crypto Corner and more of this week's top tech stories are coming right up. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the Crypto Corner. It's been an exciting week. The market cap is around 270 billion US dollars. But there have been some interesting developments when we're looking at the price. In total, 10 coins went up in this last week by over 25%. The leader being Cardano, that went up almost 50% uh, in the last seven days. The reason is that they announced now that they're getting serious with the upgrade. And so it looks like we're going to have Shelby soon on the live network. But others like Celsius, Vestchain, Zilliqa, uh, maker, um, they all went up uh, over 25%, and only one coin went down by only 15%. So overall, it has been a very good uh, uh, week from the investment point of view. But also, if we look into what happened in regards to uh, the currencies, let's take a look at Bitcoin. The last three weeks um, after the halving, the mempool is almost empty again. Um, the transactions are confirming in a very fast way. There has been no death spiral for the miners, uh, even though we lost nearly 50% of the hash rate, and but that all bounced back um, uh, nicely, and the next difficulty adjustment will be just 10% uh, down. So Bitcoin really works like a clockwork at the moment. Ethereum 2.0 is the next subject. Has been a delay, of course. <laughs> We're accustomed to that. Uh, they're now saying not uh, July, August, they're saying now uh, this year. But the interesting thing is uh, with phase zero, which is um, the implementation of uh, uh, proof of stake, so the staking, and um, the minimum you need to have is 32 Ethereum to be a, become a validator of the network. And so somebody is analyzing how many wallets are there with at least 32 Ether in them. And that has been increasing over the last uh, 12 months. Uh, so people are getting also serious and becoming a validator. Next is uh, Gemini and Samsung uh, are starting a partnership uh, whereby Gemini will be uh, supporting uh, the efforts in the North American market, so Canada and USA, um, if you're interested in buying uh, cryptos through uh, uh, through your Samsung telephone, uh, cell phone. Uh, Gemini is one of the serious and good uh, exchanges, so it's a trustworthy exchange. Uh, and that partnership will mean a lot because it will bring cryptos to the masses. At the same time, a, an interesting wallet has been developed, one that doesn't need any connectivity to the internet. Uh, so unlike the Trezor and Ledger, this one and grave it doesn't it's currently being developed but it has got already the highest uh, certifications um, that it will be launched this year and um, and it will be completely disconnected from the internet so this is another le level of security that you can have on on uh, wallets the last subject is there has been also some movement in regards to the investors so great scale investments um, which is a huge uh, investment company. They are currently buying the equivalent of 150% of all uh, new Bitcoins that, that are being mined. That's equivalent of 3.2 billion US dollars that they purchased recently in uh, uh, Bitcoins. Um, that's a significant um, uh, investment, I, I would say. 
On the other hand, and, and then you've got uh, Paul Tudor, uh, one of the hedge fund uh, gurus in the US or even globally, um, that uh, is committing to Bitcoin too. On the other hand, you've got Goldman Sachs uh, shooting against Bitcoin, although the arguments that they're bringing are not really valid. It's like somebody just being wanting to be negative and bringing arguments in that regard. So I'm, I'm, I'm positive if I look into the market. Anyway, that's from me today. Uh, I wish you a fantastic week. Looking forward to see you all next week again and back to the studio. Thank you very much for watching. Bye. Thank you, Robert. Always so insightful. Now, just a reminder for those of you who are viewing uh, that we're not providing financial advice here on the show, but rather we're sharing what's happening in the cryptocurrency market and leaving it up to you. Always remember if you're going to trade, cryptocurrency markets are ever changing and they're always volatile. So you should only spend what you can afford to lose. Now back to Becca in the newsroom. Thank you, Robbie. Microsoft has finally released Windows 10 version 2004, also known as the Windows 10 May 2020 update, and promptly warned users not to install it. The update adds new security features and fixes for previous cumulative updates to Windows 10, but it also includes a plethora of bugs and issues. This time around, even Microsoft has warned users not to install the update as it's causing severe problems like the blue screen of death, or your system might also fail to restart after installing the update. After installing the update, Windows 10 devices may be unable to connect to more than one Bluetooth device. Another bug causes mouse input to stop functioning, and another makes it so variable refresh rate no longer works in most games, especially those using DirectX 9. Always on devices such as your network adapter might cause the computer to restart randomly and other issues may result in a blue screen of death. Needless to say, this is a bad situation for Microsoft and could be catastrophic for those who are stuck working from home right now without access to an IT department to fix a botched update. Microsoft has already started working on the problems and we expect a new update to the update by mid-June. In order to safeguard your PC, you should avoid installing this update. However, if you already installed it, you can uninstall it to enjoy a more stable version of Windows 10. If you're sick of the nonsense, head on over to linuxmint.com for a free permanent fix. Researchers in Australia claim they have recorded the fastest ever internet data speed. A team from Monash, Swinburne and RMIT universities logged a data speed of 44.2 terabits per second. At that speed, you could download more than 1,000 high-definition movies or all 13 seasons of Category 5 technology TV in under one second. And we'd upgrade our live stream to 16K just because we can. The average UK broadband speed is currently around 64 megabits per second. So this would be roughly 700,000 times faster than what most people in the UK experience day to day. Australia lies in the middle of global rankings for internet speeds and show connections are a regular source of complaints from users. Researchers said they achieved the new record speed by using a device that replaces around 80 lasers found in some existing telecom hardware with a single piece of equipment known as a microcomb. The microcomb was planted into and tested outside the laboratory using existing infrastructure similar to what to that used by Australia's National Broadcast Network. The result was the highest amount of data ever produced by a single optical chip, which are used in modern fiber optic broadband systems around the world. The Australian team hope their findings offer a glimpse into how internet connections could look in the future. While the data speed for outstrips, uh, far outstrips any reasonable consumer need in today's world, Bill Kokorin, a uh, lecturer in electrical and computer systems at Monash University, said it could ultimately help transform a wide variety of industries as modern life continues to put increasing pressure on bandwidth infrastructure. Mr. Kokorin says, what our research demonstrates is the ability for fibers that we already have in the ground to be the backbone of communications networks now and in the future. He goes on to say, 
It's not just Netflix we're talking about here. This data can be used for self-driving cars and future transportation, and it can help the medicine, education, finance, and e-commerce industries, as well as enable us to read with our grandchildren from kilometers away. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash category5. From the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Fantastic. Thank you, Becca. This is Category 5 Technology TV. It's always a pleasure having you here. We've got just a couple of moments left before I wrap up the show. So just a quick little feature for you. Something that is always on my mind is nostalgia. You know me. I love retro gaming. I love things that remind me of days gone by and technology gone by. And that's where Overtype comes in. This is a website service that you can try out absolutely free at uniquecode.com slash typewriter. Let's get started. I'm just going to hit start here and check out what we can do. Ready to start typing? Oh, I didn't quite get there. So just like an old typewriter, because I jammed up the keys, I'm going to have to get over here and let's see if I can fix that. Uh, uh, uh. Perfect. Oh. <laughs> you guys remember when it was like this? It actually functions like a typewriter. Got to type slowly. You can save your work, you can print it, whatever you want to do. It really has that genuine look to it and you can mess with settings and it will actually change the way that it functions. I've got the link for that below for you. It's just a little bit of fun, but hey, it's also a lot of, uh, it's a great way to be able to create very realistic looking uh, typewriter images because you can screenshot that now or you can go file, print and um, use your, uh, your browser's ability to export to a file. And then you can create cool things for like blog headers or images for the featured image. Maybe you want to post something on Twitter and use an image to make it stand out. It gives you that really kind of nostalgic look. And it's, uh, it's incidentally, it kind of, it scratches that itch for nostalgia for me as well. Uh, again, link is below. Check it out. It's called Overtype. And the address is a little bit uh, on the unique side. So I've got that link for you right down there. Don't forget, Category 5 Technology TV is on Twitter, at Category 5 TV. I personally am also on Twitter, so at Robbie Ferguson, I will follow you back. So you can increase your follow count by one as I incidentally increase mine as well. Um, don't forget also, as you can imagine, Category 5 is on YouTube. You'll find us Category 5 Technology TV is our main show. And then we've got Linux Tech Show. You hear me talking about it, but that is an easy to digest, quick little way to consume Category 5 TV. And it makes it a, a really great to share as well, because you can just take those individual snippets and share those with your friends, anything that, uh, and on your social media, as you find things that, uh, that you really like. So check out, uh, check out Linux Tech Show on YouTube. Our website, of course, brings all of our uh, features together at category5.tv. Have a wonderful week, everyone. Again, it's a pleasure having you here. Thank you for your support, not only financially, but also just in being here and, and tuning in. Um, it is so greatly appreciated. Uh, I appreciate your subscribes on YouTube. I appreciate you following us on our various social media channels. All of that stuff helps. And uh, we love having you as a part of our community. Take care, everyone. I'll see you again next week.